Can you give me like a uh, a thumbnail pose? Like for this? Know? Yeah. <laughs> um, there we go. All right. <laughs> I don't even know if I'll use that. I may use that like no. in the first five seconds of the video. All right, hello, welcome to Photography TV. We're here to educate, entertain, and inspire you around photography. Today, I am over the moon excited. We have Thomas Heaton, who in my mind is an incredible photographer, uh, amazing storyteller, and probably the best vlogger on YouTube, an overall incredible artist. So. Thomas, thanks for joining us. Well, you're welcome. That was quite the introduction. I'm not sure if it's all true, but I'll take it. I will take it. It absolutely is true. I'm, I'm super excited. So, Thomas, one of the ways I always like to start the interviews is I say every photographer has a story. Start us off. Just tell us about your story and journey as a photographer. Oh, it's a long one. It's, it's a long one. Okay, so I guess I had to start back in the early days of school. Um, I I could never draw. Okay, I was I was a frustrated artist. Um, I loved art class. It was my favourite lesson at school, but it was just heartbreaking because my work was terrible, and I <laughs> wanted to be good. I had the sketch pad, I had the pens, the pencils, the paintbrushes. My nana was an incredible artist, um, so talented, um, and it was just something I didn't have, and and that killed me. And then when I went to college at sixteen, we. I got introduced to photography in the dark room, um, and up until that point, photography for me had always just been holiday snaps. I'd never used it as a creative tool, and then as soon as I got this camera in my hand and started to learn how to use it and, and how to develop film, then that was it. It changed my life, and then it just progressed from there. Wow, and as you've built your career, talk us through just how your career has evolved, you know, your your famously known for landscape photography has it always been landscape photography just talk us through kind of that evolution and journey as the photographer yeah so um it's it's always it's always been landscapes but not as a career so my landscapes has always been my passion that's simply because i have a passion for the outdoors yeah so it makes sense that landscapes would go hand in hand with wanting to be in the outdoors um, but career wise, I started off working for an events company, um, straight out of university and that involved a lot of video production, editing and some photography. And then I left that job after a few years and, um, it, I very much concentrated on making a living out of my photography. So it was events, corporate work, weddings, um, all the stuff that's quite easily accessible to anybody who has a passion and a skill for photography. Um, and, and But landscapes never really looked like a tangible career. Um, how do you make money in landscapes? Ah, it was a question that I, I just didn't have the answer. But I didn't worry about it because I just enjoyed doing landscapes. It was never, never supposed to be a career. Um, and then I I started my studio did a lot of studio work again it was it was great it was a great way of earning a living but it wasn't always enjoyable sometimes it was but sometimes it was tedious yeah. and just yeah. felt like a job um, and then I started to make YouTube videos after watching mountain biking videos on YouTube so I, I bought a new bike okay. and, and I was looking okay. at inspiration to go out on my bike and learn new tricks and jumps yeah. Yeah. so I turned to YouTube and then I thought, oh, I wonder, I wonder if there's any good photography YouTube channels out there. And there were a couple, um, a couple of good landscape uh, photography YouTube channels before mine. And that, that mainly, I think the two guys um, who uh, who I saw, who I watched, and who certainly made me think, okay, maybe I could do something like this. Was one of those guys was um, Ben Horn, and the other guy was Nick Carver. Both of them large format film landscape photographers. Both of them making very good YouTube videos. Um, but they were different to the sort of stuff I was doing. They were, they were very, they weren't very vloggy, but they were more, they were produced to a high quality. Um, and I thought I, I fancy doing something like this. Um, so I went out with just my iPhone. Yep. Um, so yep. it was the complete opposite to what these guys had done. It was terrible production quality. Um, but it seemed to go down well because it, it just told a story right. and, and I've realized wasn't about the production quality it was about 
the story and the content and sharing a passion. I think if you've got a passion for it, then uh, the rest just comes naturally. And it probably took me about two years of doing YouTube and building up more of a following before I realized that this is now overtaking the studio in terms of a career. In other words, it was more beneficial for me to spend time doing what I love rather than going and working in a studio. And that was a great day, but also a scary day because I realized that now landscapes and this passion that I have is a job. <laughs> that's that's worrying um, just because you yeah, I don't, I don't, I, I don't want it to become a job. If that makes sense. Of course. Um, I, I never want to go out and think, right? How am I going to make money today? And so far, I haven't. I just go out and shoot what I want to shoot, and I'm really, really trying to stay on top of that, that mantra. Totally, yeah. I understand when the passion can can become a job, which almost kind of destroys the passion to some extent. So you want to be careful with yeah. that balance. At this point, are you 100%? to landscape as a career do you still do some studio work or when could, did that big shift happen? no i i still have the studio and i still do studio work um but i i prioritize my landscape work over the studio so if a job got comes it. in in the studio and i've already got something booked in like a trip away and um, then i'll say unfortunately i can't do the studio but i still i still do um a, a couple of days a week in the studio so, um, but it, it's gradually going to just ease yeah. out. I can totally understand that. All right. Fantastic. I was checking out your Instagram account last night and one of the things I saw, which I just want to kind of get your reaction to it. You posted a picture of you in the airport next to a really big oh, yeah. print of your own. Like, yeah, you, yeah. How surreal is that? How do you kind of. No, it's really cool about? because people, you would, you would think that I would know that it was in there, but I didn't know. That's incredible. Um, so I uh, walk in through um, security yep. and then to the boarding gates of the airport. I just look at it and go, I'm sure, I'm sure that's my image. <laughs> and then when you, look, when you look in the bottom left-hand corner, you can see my name. Really? Yeah. And, I was like, and, and it was so big that I couldn't get it all in one photograph. Wow. So what you actually see is me stood next to what looks like an orange wall. <laughs> but actually, that's, yeah, that's a photograph. And that happened, it wasn't as surreal as the time that I was um, in the car going down the motorway and a, a bus drove past me and I saw my image on the back of a bus. Wow. That was pretty yeah. That is cool. So I enjoy the sightings. Yeah, oh, I'm sure. It's almost like a musician hearing their song on the radio for the yeah. first time, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. How does that come to be? So are you shooting for a specific, uh, you know, publication or how does that image get sold and then ultimately end up there well on this instance um this was for a commission i did last year which was for a tourist board so i shot all the landscapes in the north of england um and so all of these billboards in airports on the back of buses are to promote tourism okay. in england so that's what that is but sometimes um i don't do this anymore um, but i used to upload my images to uh, stock sites and give them to photography agents who would sell them on and you usually get 50 or 60 percent um so yeah occasionally i see my images in magazines or books or you know various things and and it's difficult to keep track of where exactly they've come from because they go into an agency and the agent just spams them around the world um, but this one was quite good because it, it was for a specific commission. So yes, uh, it's nice to know that nobody else is getting a cut. There you go. Uh, yeah, so that's good. Pre-planned job. Now, if somebody wanted to be a landscape photographer, how would you advise them to get started? What would you tell them? Well, it's a tricky one because um, there are there are lots of ways to make money from landscape photography. And the difficulty is making enough money from enough different sources to be able to make it a living. Um, I would say landscape, if you if you want to be a landscape photographer as a job, and that's your only motivation, I'd say don't do it because you're going to fail. Okay. Um, okay. It, you know, you can't decide you want, you want the lifestyle of traveling and taking photographs. That sounds quite cool. Um, you can probably make lots of money because you can't. What you, have, you have to have the passion. 
Yes. Um, so you, you need to love landscape photography because you love photography and that's it. And then what you'll find is if you love it enough and you do it enough, opportunities will start to pre present themselves and it takes a long time. Um, I, I had an email um, last week from a, a young lad who was quite frustrated because he was saying he was going out and doing all this work and he wasn't getting any recognition, wasn't getting a following on Instagram, wasn't getting a following on Facebook. Um, and then at the bottom of the email, he gave me a bit of information about his equipment and he said that he bought his camera, his first DSLR, he bought it one year ago. I said, dude, one year's not enough. You can't, like, you, what, what are you expecting? It takes years of just consistent, you know, pho taking photographs, conversing with other, other photographers, reading magazines, writing into magazines, um, just basically getting out there and being interested. Because if you're interested, you chat and you talk and you yes, share. Yes. And then that's when opportunities start to open up. Um, you can't just go for a job interview and get the job. Um, right, but I would say right. a good place to start is if you, you probably, if you're a photographer, you probably read photo, uh, photography magazines. It might as a surprise it might not but these photography magazines rely on people like us to produce the content so write into those magazines all of them have submission emails where you can submit an article um, or you can submit images so that's what I would recommend and then if you get in a magazine then you get huge credibility and it's it usually pays quite well as well oh, and good. yeah oh, don't forget good. that these magazines need us um, because if it wasn't for us and the, the readers, there'd be no magazine. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a good place to start writing into your favorite magazines. That's good. That's, that's good. good. Got to yeah. have the passion, be patient, yeah. and persevere, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. totally. Good. Thomas, thank you so much. Let's get into landscape photography now more from whether someone wants to be a professional, whether they just enjoy doing it uh, as a hobby. What would be some landscape photography tips the absolute okay. do's and don'ts. Just give us some tips from your perspective. Oh, I have so many tips. Okay. Okay. Um, get a tripod. <laughs> need a tripod. Wake up early. Wake up earlier than you think you need to be up. Um, and stay out late. And just don't try too hard. Okay. Don't try and get everything in, which is what we all do. Um, we, we go to an amazing vista, huge mountain, and we go, wow, look at the sunrise, look at that mountain, wow. What you actually need to do is stop and just think for a second and say, okay, what what is it? What is it that I love about this? What am I looking at? Is it the whole thing? Is it the way the light's falling off the mountain? Is it the reflection in the water? And what you can actually do is hone in and focus on smaller parts of the landscape, uh, which quite often could be much more effective than just going for a big picture where everything gets lost um so yeah don't try too hard uh, simple simplicity is always the best so if you're getting on your hands and knees and getting down low and trying to squeeze this in and get this in and make this work it's probably not going to work if you just walk up to a scene and you should just see it um and it'll be simple and yeah that will be the mo probably the most effective photograph so um yeah, get up early, stay out late, get a tripod, and don't try too hard. That's good. Thank you. In Thank fact, you. your last Back. tip there, don't try too hard. Probably one of the things I'm I'm super impressed with everything you do on YouTube with your, your storytelling, all that good stuff. But one of the things I'm most in awe of is, I'll just say, your patience. Like, you'll go to the scene that I would just get in click mode and just start taking all these pictures. And you'll have the patience to just find the right composition, wait for it and walk away, at least on the on the channel, one image. How yeah. do you have that yeah. patience and how do you find that one image in the midst of all the potential images that could be out there? Okay, well, there's two things. Um, one is I'm making a video. Yeah. So if I see an image, it's not just a case of setting up the camera and taking the image. So I get the video camera out, do some footage, get some B-roll, do a piece of the camera, talk about the image, get the camera out, take the photograph, then do some kind of outro before moving on to the next scene. So one photograph, which if I was not filming, would take like three or four minutes, yes. ends up taking 20 minutes because I've got to do all the filming around it to make it work. Um, 
So when I'm out doing a video, I'm very, very selective about the photographs I take because I know that as soon as I commit to taking a photograph, then I commit to doing the film and then there's 20 minutes, half an hour gone. Um, if I'm not filming, sometimes I go out with my camera. I don't always film. Um, I do take more photographs because it's you, it's a lot more, you, know, you have a lot more flexibility. You can move around quicker, um, but still not many. And I think all that is, it's, it's experience. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've, in the early days, I'd go out and see a, an amazing sunrise and I would just get excited and I would snap, 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 mm -hmm. snap. And then I'd go home and have hundreds of images to trawl through. And they'd all be, some of them would be okay. And then I'd always think, oh, if I'd have just waited here for the light to be at its best, because when the light, usually when the light's at its best, you're running between locations, always searching for the next best image, or the grass is always greener. And you'll soon learn with experience that the grass isn't always greener. You need to stay put um, and get the, first of all, find the best composition. Yep. And then you have to yep. wait for that composition to be at its best. Um, and then that's how you get the best images. It's definitely quality over quantity. Yeah, that's well yeah, said. That's... You know, I'm definitely guilty of the inexperience and just taking too many. And I... No, but it's a great way to learn. It's, yeah. it's a really good way to learn. So I don't, I don't expect um, anybody to go out and buy a camera and then, <laughs> then just take one picture. That's, <laughs> right. No, that's how that's how you learn. So don't don't force it. But it good. it's the natural progression. It's just what will happen. Um, and even sometimes when the conditions are really special, I, I flap and run around taking lots and lots of pictures trying to yeah. capture it all. And there's nothing wrong with that. But, yeah, you'll you'll soon learn with experience what works and what doesn't work. So it comes naturally and you'll just take your time and walk away with the best image rather than lots of OK or good images. Yeah, that's fantastic. <laughs> Clearly, I, I've seen that in what you do and the experience is definitely there. Um, one thing I, I just don't have a lot of experience with is using filters. Um, talk me through like how often are you using filters? What types of filters are your go-to? Just give me a little bit of an overview there. I think it'd be really helpful. Uh, I, I always, well, most of the time use filters. They really help. I'm a, I'm a big fan of filters. Um, a lot of people would argue that you don't need them. Um, and it's true you don't, but for example, I'm, I always, or well, most of the time use a polarizing filter. Okay which um which reduces glare and reflection and it makes the image more contrasting more satur more saturated um and it gives the image a look a certain look that you can't achieve any other way and that's because if you have a reflective surface in your image such as wet rocks or um there's haze in the atmosphere um it gets rid of all of that um it polarizes the light so your image just it looks richer um, and just much better. Um, ND filters, that's an obvious one. Sometimes yeah. we like to slow yeah. down our exposures um, to capture movement in the landscape. And then, yeah, ND grads, um, not always needed because you can just bracket your exposures. Um, but again, I like them because they give a very organic, natural feel to the image. Um, and it, yeah, there are occasions when they won't work. Um, sure. But sure. when they do, I always favor those over bracketing my exposures okay okay good good all right um well on this point your trips how do you plan your trips how do you know what the location's going to be like talk us through kind of a trip planning process right uh, it depends if i if i travel abroad then a lot more planning goes into it because i have to book flights and book accommodation and plan which areas i'm going to go to um, but most of my trips are very, in the UK, they're very last minute, they're very spontaneous. I went, what day is it today? What day is it today? Friday. Friday yeah. So on, Friday. on Tuesday, um, on Tuesday, I saw that the weather forecast was looking really good, like really good. It's so rare in, in this country to get day where there's no <laughs> wind and warm sunshine. So I grabbed my tent, grabbed my camera and I just went into the mountains um, and I climbed up the one of the biggest mountains in England, one of the highest biggest, well, the highest mountains in England, um, Great Gable. It's um, it's amazing. And and every time I've been in that region of the mountains, it's always been windy and wet. But on Wednesday, it was forecast to be clear with no wind. 
So I climbed up this 3,000 foot mountain um, and stood on the top of it and there was just no wind. It was just still and we had this amazing sunset um, and it was just just phenomenal. And I, I didn't plan it. I planned it the morning before I left. I was like, okay, the weather's good. I really fancy going into the mountains. Yep. And then I start to yep. narrow down, okay, which mountain do I want to go to? And I need to figure out how I'm going to sleep. So I'll usually look on Google Earth and find a good flat, dry spot that I can pitch a tent. Um, and and that's it, really. So it's, it's, yeah, I contradict myself a lot because sometimes I say you should meticulously plan your shoots and sometimes I think you should just be spontaneous and see what happens. So I don't think I've answered that very well. <laughs> no, it's good. Now, the story brought it to life of, you know, sometimes it is spontaneous based on the weather, the light that you anticipate. Just get out there and make something happen. Yeah. That's good. But a lot, of, a lot of my trips are inspired by seeing other people's work. You know, they see these amazing locations from around the world. And you go, wow, where is that? And then next thing you know, you're booking a plane ticket, <laughs> like Zion National Park, for example. And, I saw that uh, one, yeah. Yeah, and it's like, it's incredible. And to find locations i just I use google earth i use Flickr, um hashtags in instagram and twitter and and soon enough you can build a mental map about where everything is and how it looks that's good now i'm sure with all the travels you've done it's too hard to just say hey here was the best but what was one of the most memorable locations and, and shoots that you captured um i'm gonna i'm gonna say zion because it was the most peaceful place I've ever been. Wow. Um, when you get away from the crowds, don't get me wrong, you know, the, the crowds are crazy. Um, but you can get away from them. And I went to the east side of Zion National Park and dropped down into one of the washes. Um, so you're away from the roads, you're away from people, there's no footpaths, it's just... And I remember seeing the mountain sheep, or the bighorn sheep, uh, scurrying across the rock face there was no wind there was warm sunshine there was amazing autumnal colors all around and i could hear the birds singing and it was pure zen wow. <laughs> it was just it was just like i was like wow this is nice i could do this every day because most of my shoots involve wind and yeah. rain yeah. and climbing up a mountain getting out of breath um not all of them but zion was just amazingly beautiful and incredibly peaceful so um, i need to get back there definitely um so yeah yeah well i wouldn't say my images from there are the best but in terms of experience definitely one of the best you told the story well you brought me there i was there with you (laughs) here you talk about it any locations that are on your uh wish list that you haven't been to yet Mm, lots I um I really I really I'd say number one top of the list is Greenland. Um I need to get to Greenland somehow, some way. Um and then of course South America, Chile, Patagonia, that area, Argentina. That would be amazing. Um well yeah, number one on my list is Greenland. You, I'm sure you've been to Iceland. I've been to Iceland, yes. Yeah. yeah. But Greenland I'm sure is a totally different experience. Yeah, it looks again. It's just, it's. I think it's just starting to become popular. Okay. So if you go, if you go now, then you'll be, you know, you can be fairly original. But I think yes. in a few years it'll be the next Iceland. It'll be, you know, fair. Well, I think a lot of the travel companies are starting to to move in there. So I need to get there soon. Okay. Good. I'm looking forward to seeing it. So let's talk about uh, YouTube again. Um, what has it been like growing on YouTube? You mentioned the last two, two and a half years or so since you've been doing it. What has that experience been like? And just talk us through. through right, it's, interest, it's interesting because for me, it, it just feels the same. Nothing's changed. Um, I, don't, I don't feel better than anyone. I don't feel more special than anyone. I don't think I'm the best photographer out there. Um, so... I, I feel exactly the same. There's no ego, you know. There's Clearly. nothing. I'm I, I'm always surprised when people ask me to come and speak at an event or a conference. I'm like, what? I'm just, <laughs> I'm just a normal guy. Um, but the one thing that has changed um, noticeably more than anything is I get recognised almost everywhere I go. It's usually when I'm out with my camera, 
um, yeah. and that's fine yeah. to be expected. I always, always, you know, have a good chat with um, whoever it is that says, "Hey, you, you're Thomas Eaton. I know you're over YouTube." I'm like, yeah, nice. And we have a good chat about photography. But sometimes it happens when I'm <laughs> walking the dog or going out for dinner, and 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 the worst thing is when I see people double take. So they, I'll be in the supermarket and they go. <laughs> yeah. He just knows me. It's oh, it's hot. It's uh, sometimes a bit awkward. But um, that is that's the biggest thing that's changed is I get recognised and most of the time I like it and I have a good chat with the people who come up to me and say hello. But sometimes it's a bit awkward. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And and that's just my fault probably. But um, if I'm with my camera, yeah, it's fine. Yeah. It's when I'm not expecting it. Um, but it's always funny. I always take it with a pinch of salt. As you, yeah, and you you're so good at what you do. Uh, that's that's just so interesting. Thanks for sharing. Um, any videos that you want to make that you haven't made yet? Anything on that yes. list? Of, yeah, tell us. Yeah, more. I, don't, I don't know. If, I don't know if I can tell you in case they get stolen. <laughs> uh, I've got loads of ideas, tons of ideas. Um, no, I would call hero videos. So. Uh, they require more time and effort, more planning. Probably, they would require extra help. Um, gotcha. So, gotcha. one one of the things is I really like shooting on my own. Um, all of my most of my videos, anyway, I'm always out by myself, yeah. and that's because yeah. that's then I can be completely natural and 100% myself. It's a bit like when you're in the bathroom and you're in front of the mirror. You can you just you can do anything in front of the mirror because yeah. there's, there's no yeah. inhibitions. You know, you, you sing, you do silly faces or whatever. Um, it's kind of like that when I'm out on my own with the camera. I'm a lot more relaxed and I'm much more myself. But as soon as somebody's with me, I, I start thinking a bit more about what I'm actually saying and I become a lot more self-aware. So, um, yeah, to have somebody with me filming, it's something I need to work on, basically. Yes. But, yes. yeah, I do, I do have... A, a few um, video ideas. I have them all written down, and it's just a case of finding time to do them. Kind of a bigger kind potential bigger. projects. Yeah. Have, have you thought about? I'm sure you thought about, but is there any in the future, like a Thomas Heaton tutorial, online course, something like that in your future? Um, maybe. Um, again. I, it's difficult because I think photography, I think anyone can learn it quite easily in terms of t the technical side. So I'm not sure how comfortable I would be doing a photography tutorial, for example, teaching you about aperture and shutter speed and everything like that. But then there are certain skills and certain things that you can't necessarily learn um, as easily. And I think that would be a great thing to teach, such, such as... Um, composition navigation how you you know how you see things yeah. um yeah. so i haven't really thought much about that um but yeah possibly um i'd like to do more workshops um, i know i've got i've got one in iceland in july and i'm doing the uh, acadia um, out of acadia workshop actually yeah. with nick page yeah. who was on yeah. your show yeah. not too long ago um so yeah that's something i would really like to do more of um it's just figuring out the logistics for sure i could almost imagine your tutorial not being the hey here's aperture shutter speed but more being like a virtual workshop like bring people along with you experience yeah no. that could be super cool yeah i'd also like to do a, a book as well a printed hardback book is probably going to be my sort of next big project oh that'll be good i will yeah. buy one. <laughs> oh, well that's great i'll put you on the list <laughs> please do Please do. So one question I do want to ask, which this may just be super weird, but I, on one of your videos, I saw a tattoo on your arm. Uh, Tell us about the tattoo. What is it? How did it come to be? All right. So this is a, it's a, where are we? There we are. There it is. It's a, it's a stopwatch, um, like a pocket watch with, it has a compass on it. And the compass is, uh, facing a northwesterly direction because I'm from the northwest. Yeah. The clock, the time on the clock is, well, should be 11 <laughs> minutes past 11 because that's when you make a wish. And underneath it's got Charlotte's name. Oh, fantastic. So that's what that is. 
That's cool. I figured it meant something, so I thought I'd ask. Yeah, no, no, so that's fair enough. That it is. I got it, I got this done years ago, and it was the most painful thing I've ever done. <laughs> <laughs> You're not going back for another. It sounds like. No, no, no. That's it. This not is get it. The whole sleeve. No, <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't handle it. I couldn't handle it. Very good. Thomas, thank you for joining us. Uh, incredible interview. You are an incredible inspiration to millions out there. Thank you for what you do and thank you so much for joining us. No problem. Thank you for having me.